In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. So I think what's been on everybody's mind and thoughts is uh, the war going on in Israel and Palestine. Right? It's all over the news and the media, um, and it's you know the sites and the the clips and the and the statistics that are coming out of the number of dead, the number injured, the number who are in danger. Um, it's alarming, and and it's a lot to take in, right? And the civil uh, civilian casualties continue to rise. There's all these threats of we're going to do this, and if you do this, then I'm going to do this, and you know it's really it's a really bad situation. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that it does is it strikes fear in us, right? Fear of not knowing, you know, really the severity and fear of not knowing like what to do and the fear of wondering, okay, there's no end in sight um, for this. And we're always asking ourselves, well, what comes next? Um, you know, what do we do? And there's an overwhelming sense of helplessness that's associated with this and and the war in Israel and Palestine right now is one of many ugly situations within the world. It's not the only one. It's taken like, you know, center stage, but it's not. It's accompanied by so many different situations around the world that leaves us wondering like, well, what can I do? Right, and and we go through the normal things. If if you have friends or relatives or know of people, you're calling them, you're checking on them, uh, you're seeing what's happening with them. We watch the news, and the news like only feeds our anxiety and our worries. And and in some situations, we offer assistance in in whatever way that may look like. But at the end, we're still here. Right, at the end, we're still unable to do much for what is happening over there. And what we often, what our minds gravitate to and our hearts gravitate to is healing, right? And any assistance that we want to offer is an assistance towards healing. We would like to see things get better. And that's the story of today's gospel, right? Today's gospel is a story of assistance and healing. And it's a story that, that many of us are familiar with, where the Lord was preaching, likely early on in his ministry, and people were beginning to gather. And these four um, individuals, these four men, brought somebody who was a paralytic, so they brought him on a bed or a stretcher or some sort of device at that time, which... Um, was probably difficult to maneuver, and, and wherever Jesus went, there were always difficult crowds, all right? a lot of crowds, a lot of people coming, and he, he was preaching in houses, right? And it's, I mean, it's, it's wild to think like, okay, the creator of the world, what was his platform? Someone's home, right? Someone's home. That's where he spoke from. That's where he taught from, um, especially early on in his ministry, um, and these four individuals are bringing this paralytic man to him, but don't know how to get to him. And eventually, they make their way up to the roof. And, and in, in those days, the houses, they had stairs on the side uh, because they, they, they used the roof. Um, and they, they made it through, and they broke through the roof, and then they lowered the man through. Right? Not an easy feat. In today's world, definitely not an easy feat at that time, right? It's only a feat that is accomplished by a true desire and love for your fellow man, right? What they accomplished and the position they put this paralytic man in is something that is accomplished only by the desire of love that you have for this individual. Right? That's what pushed him through. And when we look at you know, how this unfolds, Jesus says something very clear. And he says, And Jesus, seeing their faith, this is after he's lowered, lowered down, 
And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Right? Seeing their faith, he says to the paralytic, Sons, you're for, your, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Right? While our faith is very personal, it contains a great potential to do positive things, loving things for those around us, right? While our faith is very personal, it contains a potential to influence and do something amazing for those around us, right? But what fuels that is the personal relationship that we have with God, right? It fuels our ability and our drive and our passion to serve others, right? And it's in, these, in this story that we see, okay, it's the faith that these four have for this man that if they brought him to Jesus, that healing would happen. It's their faith, right? Jesus is still new. The ministry is still new. There's a lot of like questions, but for some reason, from what they've heard and what others have experienced of Jesus, they believe that if we brought him to Jesus, that a healing would happen, right? So the faith fuels our service to others. And it's not surprising that when we act on our faith, that when we allow it, to dictate our actions, when we allow it to push us to serve others, to sacrifice for the other person, that we are often left feeling fulfilled. We are often left feeling uplifted when we sacrifice for others, when we do something, when we bring somebody to Christ or we bring Christ to them, whatever the situation may be. But when that happens, we are left inside being filled. We are left being satisfied. We are left having a greater sense of purpose and meaning. And it's not surprise, it's not a surprise that we experience this. The number of times where I've spoken to somebody, I've been away from church, been away from church, or I've even been in church, but not really active in church, and I'm just doing things in the humdrum of life, and then all of a sudden they like do a service and they feel like Something has been missing from my life. It's not a surprise that an individual experiences this. Why? Let's look at what St. Paul said in 2 Corinthians. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Right? So we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. In our service and love to others, we step into our sonship of God. When we look at the relationship between God and Christ here on earth, God the Father and God the Son, right? What did the Son always say? I'm here to do the will of the Father, right? Well, when we look and say, well, what's the will of the Father? What was Jesus doing? He was going around. He was serving. He was sacrificing. He was healing. He was doing all these different things. He was living for others, right? He was enduring for others. And that was a pleasing aroma to the Father. And now what St. Paul is saying is that when we follow suit, we become that same aroma. We become something that is pleasing to God, right? Well, we're not going to emphasize it, but the relationship between the Father and the Son is one of love, right? And, and that love was part of, like part of that love was obedience. And so when we too follow what Christ said, and when he said, like, go and do likewise, go and imitate me, right? When we go and do the same, we step into this love relationship with the Father. And that is the most fulfilling relationship that we can have. So when we do the same as Christ did, we too become this pleasing aroma. And you know what? Deep in our soul, 
we smell our own aroma. Right? I'm not talking about our physical aroma. Right? We can smell deep inside our souls. We can smell when something is not right. We can smell when something is missing. We can smell ourselves when I'm just going through life and I just, something is off and I'm feeling selfish. Like we can smell this. We can also smell ourselves when we are doing what God wants us to do. There's a certain peace that comes with that. There's a certain fulfillment that comes with that. There's a greater purpose in life that comes with that, right? And we can smell both situations. We know it, right? We can smell both the good and the bad. We know our aroma. But what we need to be asking is that, okay, we know what God, what Christ did when he did on this earth. And we know that was part of the loving relationship with him. I know that I am called to be the fragrance of Christ here on earth. What does that practically mean? And St. Paul addresses this in the epistle as well. Because St. Paul, he's writing here to um, the church in Corinth. And the church in Corinth, a bit of a like unique relationship between him and Paul in the sense that he was serving them, he was nurturing them, but at the same time, they were always questioning his apostleship, right? His ability or his authority to serve them. And so there's always this dialogue throughout First and Second Corinthians of Paul trying to say like, I love you, I'm sacrificing for you, right? And my sacrifice for you and my service for you is a proof of my love to you, right? So there's this undertone in the, in, in the, um, in the two epistles to the church in Corinth from Paul. And so St. Paul kind of touches on this and well, what's the practical implication of being the fragrance of Christ? And the way that St. Paul says it to them, he's like, you are an epistle written on my heart, right? And he says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, he says, you are our epistle written in our heart, known and read by all men. Why does he choose this word epistle? Choose the word epistle, which the word epistle also means letter, okay? Is that whenever a high-ranking individual or representative comes to a certain area to do something, he comes with a letter of commendation, right? So the institution back at home sends him with a letter and says, okay, he's a credible person, listen to him. Right? It's a letter of commendation that gives him a certain authority or gives him you know, a certain respect to do the things he needs to, do, needs to do in the area. And even in the early church, like when they would send people out, all right, out to the time of Paul, they would send them with letters. Right? And, and I'll give you a quick example biblically too. Like when in Acts chapter 15, the church met together in the Council of Jerusalem and were discussing the, um, the issue regarding circumcision. What did they do? They ended up writing a letter and they gave it to the apostles and they sent them out saying, we met in Jerusalem and we're sending these individuals to you to let you know that this is what we decided on the issue, right? So this is a letter of commendation. This is an epistle that he's talking about. And St. Paul is talking with them and he's saying, like, look, I didn't come with this letter. But the letter is written here on my heart. And you can see it in the service that I'm offering to you. You can see it in the sacrifice I'm making. You can see it in the way that I'm living because I'm not asking you for money. I'm preparing my own, like, way of living, right, which is difficult. But I'm also, like, I'm serving you. I'm teaching you. And I don't want anything in return, right? He's got nothing in it other than they know Christ. He said, that's the epistle. That's the authority in which I'm coming to you and serving you. Right? He was more or less saying, the proof is in the pudding. Right? The proof of my love for you, the proof of my sacrifice for you, the proof that I have this epistle is in 
the way that I'm dealing with you. He goes on to say, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on table, tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human heart. All right? It is driven by what is inside Paul's heart. All right? What was driving, what was the driving force of the four men carrying the paralytic? It was a desire and a belief that they should know the Lord, that, that he should be in front of the Lord. All right? That was the epistle of their love. Paul didn't need a letter because the letter that was written was a letter of compassion, a letter of sacrifice, and a letter of long-suffering. And that's all written on the heart. It's not written on paper. Right? The epistle of the heart sees the people in front of them. The epistle written on our hearts sees the person in front of you. <sighs> when we struggle with what to do with what's happening in the world, with Palestine and Israel and all the different you know, catastrophes and, and horrible situations that are happening across the world, we tend to exhaust ourselves with worry. And our worry does nothing. But if we truly want to help the situation, we have to act on the epistle that is written in our heart. And that requires us to see the person in front of us, to serve the person here, Serve the person in our neighborhood. Serve the person in our offices. God called us to serve them. God called us to love them. When Christ came, who was he coming for? The world. Who did he interact with? A geographical region. Did he, did he touch base with everybody in the world? No. He started with those around him. And he knew that his example in the people that he would meet would serve as an example to everybody else and eventually to the world. We want to do something for what's happening there and what's happening all around the world. It has to happen first with the epistle written in our heart for the person in front of us. If we don't have that epistle, if we don't have that action, the prayer, the anxiety, the worry for all the different catastrophes in the, in the world mean nothing. Pointless. Waste of time. Don't get wrapped up in what is happening and do nothing where you are living. We are called to be epistles to the person in front of us. And if we did that faithfully, our church would change, our city would change, our country would change. Do you not think that the situation there and everybody everywhere else wouldn't change if everybody had an epistle written on their heart? For sure it would change. One by one. It would change. But when we're not faithful to the epistle written on our heart for the other person, for the person in front of us, all the worry for everything else that's happening in the world. It's just worry. It's to ease our own conscience. It's not practical. The Lord was practical when he came. He served the person in front of him. That was the epistle written on his heart. What is written on yours? What is written on mine? If I can't answer that, don't worry about the rest of the world. Worry about that. Because that's what we are called to. That's the example that we had in Christ. It's the example that the, the apostles, when they went and preached, they served the person in front of them. And that's the ministry that has been handed down to us. 
to worry about the person in front of us. Who or what is written on your heart? Everybody has to ask that question. And if nothing is written on your heart, and the only thing written on my heart is let me take care of myself, let me take care of like everything that is immediate to me, because everything else is a little bit of an inconvenience, everything else will take finances, everything else will take you know, time and energy and sacrifice and all these different things, and I just don't have the capacity. That's the issue, okay? We need to look and say, what letter is written on my heart? And I have to address that before anything else. We pray for other places, great. But if we pray for other places, without looking at what's happening here and how am I serving the person in front of me, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Your minute of silence, we all look in. And we all look at the aroma in deep in our soul and say, is it an aroma of compassion, of long-suffering, and of sacrifice for the person in front of me? That was the ministry of Christ that was handed down to us. And that is the most important ministry. And that is the one that changes my home, my life, my church, my city, and my country. But it starts right there. And glory be to God forever. Amen.